Welcome back, my friends. Welcome back to Art Nerds. This is the podcast where we get to talk with our nerdy, nerdy friends about their artwork. My name is Michael Bryan, and today I have with me one of my dearest and oldest friends, uh, meaning the relationship is old, not him. Uh, this is Mr. Bill Ald. How are you, Bill? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. Thanks for getting up so early and doing this with me. Yeah, it's almost the crack of noon where I'm at right now. So. <laughs> okay, just to let the listeners know, this is one of the first <laughs> podcasts we've done uh, remotely over the internet. So uh, you're in, where are you at, in Ohio somewhere? Uh, I'm up near Detroit right now. Oh, you're in Michigan. Oh. Okay, never mind. Um, uh, but I'm East Coast time, and you're you're I'm running around in the yeah, I'm Southern Midlands Illinois of the country. <laughs> Um, well, let's jump right, uh, let's jump right in. Bill, tell us, what is your art? When I grew up, I ran away and joined the circus. And from <laughs> that moment till now, I have been traveling the world flying people on wires for a living. <laughs> uh, there's been a couple other, there's been a couple other, it hasn't been as linear a path as that sentence makes it to be. <laughs> But generally speaking, that is the uh, that is the crux of my art. That, that's that's the big uh, super objective, as it were. Exactly. Was that the goal at any time? Uh, the goal was actually to make action movies. So uh, we met. So for full disclosure for your viewing audience or listening audience, I guess uh, we met when we were at Bowling Green State University. We were both in grad school. You were you were going on and working for your PhD because you're a you're a intelligent folk like that. Uh, <laughs> well, and, that that's, and I was that's debatable, was, but we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a, there's a couple of conceits we're gonna have to take for this argument for it to work. <laughs> One of which is that a we both know what we're talking about. Uh, everything else kind of falls from there. So uh, we met when I was at school. I went there as an undergrad. And when I was an undergrad, right at that time, I'm not telling you how old I am, but VHS tapes were a thing. And uh, I walked in, I was in the, I was, I was in the dorm and I come stumbling back from, I was in theater and I come stumbling back at like, I don't know, midnight or something from some uh, re rehearsal or, or loadout or bender or whatever it was. And, uh, Somebody had set up in the TV lounge at the end of the hall. They'd brought their VCR down and they'd set up kind of a movie night. And I'd walked in right at the start of Jackie Chan's uh, movie, Police Force. Oh. Technically, it's Police Story 4. I know most of your audience <laughs> is screaming that out right now. Oh, However, <laughs> come on, give it the right credit. Uh, and I saw that and I was like, that's what I want to do for a living. Um, and so I just decided like that, that sounds like a good, that was kind of always in the back of my mind and it took about a decade, but, uh, but basically I, I kind of managed to get into the industry of performer rigging. Uh, and, and I, I can't say I wasn't already inclined to be artistic and performative and all that sort of stuff, but I wasn't really an actor. And I, I kind of had an analytical mind for it. And so wire work uh, became kind of a cool thing for me. And uh, at some point, I happened to find a, a, a gentleman who was teaching. A, I'd, I'd gone through it. College was some of the best decades of my life. Let's just put that out right now. Uh, <laughs> I had, I don't, everybody has to collect something. You know, I collect college degrees. Okay. Uh, much better than restraining orders, let's yeah, be honest. Uh, one of my favorite Rosie O'Donnell jokes. I went to so many that? colleges, I couldn't see out the back of my window. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I, I, my last one was at Northern Illinois University. And there was a gentleman who had just started, he would just sort of taken over the program. And I was out in California at the time. And I was, was trying to get into rigging, specifically performer rigging and wire work and, and kind of being out being out in that industry, it, it was it, it's a, it was a good place for it, geographically speaking, but not having any idea what questions to ask was a real kind of limiting factor. Sure, and so that makes sense. It, it, it wasn't that I was dumb, it's that I was ignorant, which is often kind of a... Would you a, say you a, a, lacked resources so, as well? Um. Yes, and I think once again, it all kind of stemmed from the fact that I just didn't know what I didn't know. I, I didn't know what to ask. I didn't know where to go, 
you're just kind of sitting on a on a park bench going man i wish i could do that right and uh you know this was right i i had uh this was right about 2001 2002 um and this they had opened up this program and a couple people had called me and said look you want to get back to school you want to get back to grad school uh you this is a this gentleman now is this guy out of chicago and and it looks like this program but one of the things that he is known for is performer rigging this gentleman's name was tracy nunnally and you should talk to him you should you should and so i uh, and his name is tracy and i've only seen it on the paper and i didn't know I, I remember sitting down to write the email and i didn't know which salutation is it mr is it mrs is it <laughs> And I remember staring at my computer screen for about 15 minutes going, how do I start this email? Like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Can't, you don't want to screw it up before you get started. Ex exactly. I was like, that's a great first impression. Um, and so, you know, uh, dear, uh, dear, dear uh, so-and-so. And I sent it out and said, you know, I understand your NIU is starting a program. This is a first class that's going through. Is it too late to apply? And I got this uh, message back. It said, absolutely, it's not too late. Deadline closes at 5 today, so go ahead and submit your stuff. <laughs> no, I wow. didn't realize that I actually wrote them on the very last day of application. So, it's yet. so I went running around and uh, uh, got everything in, and that started this. Uh, that, that was kind of my way in. And, I, uh, and, uh, and from that day to this, I've managed to make a, make a pretty good run of it, I guess. So... Well, being linked to your social media and watching you stand posed next to all the people hanging out of the air. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, well, thank you. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think you're doing quite well for yourself. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, why rigging? Why performance rigging? I mean, out of all the area, I mean, I could probably guess having known you for the many years, <laughs> uh, but I want it from the horse's mouth. Why? This specific little niche in live theater and live performance, as opposed to, oh my God, whatever other tiny little niche. What about sure. this? Well, well, but see, one of the things you have to take, one of the things that you you have to sort of realize is that the world we live in today is uh, it's a specialized world. It's a skills based economy. It's a skills based environment. If you have a skill you have a job. And the one thing that you cannot do and get a job is to be a generalist. So you can't say, I just want to be famous, right? There's, right. there's a lot of people, we, we kind of see this with, with social media now, there's a lot of influencers and they go, I want to be famous. But, but nobody is just famous. Why are you, why, what do you do, right? And, and in, in the entertainment world, in the artistic world of any sort, creative in general, uh, the, the question that I always did, so I, I, uh, I ran the program at Kent State University, Tuscaroras, for about a decade. I, I ran the theater program. I stepped down from there in 2019. And one of the things that we'd always say to people going through is you have to find your niche. See, live events has got a lot of facets, but all those facets, it's a many-faceted little diamond, but all of them are quite exclusive. You have people who are you know, in sound and in lights and in costumes and in performance. And then even in performance, you break it down even farther, right? Oh, you're a right. dancer. You're a musical theater guy. You're an actor. But you're not just, oh, you do this type of acting. Oh, you're you're a voiceover. You're a dialogue, dialect kind of guy. Right. Um, as long as you can shave that down to what you are interested in, because th then, then you are usable. You're usable by the world right and it, and it sounds kind of mercenary to say it that way it's not mercenary it's practical um because i want you to realize where you're going right? right we all want to get there we all have a we all have a reason that we're doing this you're you're innately driven for it or you're just creative or you're you know you have a you have a thing that you want to see realized um and i was going into technical theater i, I started as an actor and i and i as much as I, everybody kind of has that, you know, hey, look at me. Uh, right, they all start as actors little. somewhere. Right, yeah, it, just in life, you know. <laughs> uh, it's it's either in the front room or you're, you know, you're doing stand up into your mirror or you're singing or whatever. Right, sing along uh, the records, what have you. Sure, 
Um, I, I, I just, I, I didn't jive with that. I, I wanted to be a part of the world, but that wasn't my thing. And I started to work farther and farther backstage and sort of into the technical aspects of it. And, and when you get into the technical aspects of it, once again, you kind of have to find your niche. And I was, for a while, a technical director. I worked as a, if you, uh, if anybody knows the Looking Glass Theater in Chicago, it's the one that David Schwimmer started, uh, name drop there. But, uh, um, but uh, I, I was the TD for that. And, uh, and, and I, I hated, there, there, there's a gentleman <laughs> who kind of crystallized what I was about in, in, in answer to your question. Um, it's two o'clock in the morning and the things are wildly behind and stuff hasn't come in on time and, and the designs and he's kind of the, he's the set designer and he's kind of the reason why everything is just weeks behind and we are opening in days and we're pulling all nighters to get this thing built. And it's two o'clock in the morning and he's come in to kind of check and make sure that his vision is being realized, which is an extremely pompous thing to do because... right. The one thing you learn in the arts. There's a, there's a couple of things that are sort of the hallmarks of an artist. And um, by the way, let's just put this out right now. Uh, I hope you don't mind if we tangent just a wee bit today. Uh, <laughs> That's why you're well, on the show. <laughs> I know. I have the focus of a monkey with ADD. Uh, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> to I say I bounce. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Uh, so super one. bounce balls look at you and just go, what the hell? Good God, man. <laughs> Calm it down a little bit. Let's just back a notch. Uh, so tangent one, go. Oh, we're, I think we're about four right now. Oh, okay. Uh, the <laughs> hallmarks of an artist. It, yes. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're immune. Says a lot about the world you live into. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the what makes uh, people artistic like this is the art nerds podcast right so we're gonna Go if, for it, if you really want to sort of look at who is nerdy about art there's a couple of things that you have to have um one of which is uh you get bored very easy yes yes not to your deficit but and, and that's not a symptom of creativity that's a driver of creativity right yeah it's that boredom it's you hate repetition um and it's not the fact that you hate it. I think that's a poor word choice. You get bored with repetition very easy, and your right. mind starts to go, "Great, da 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 that 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 rhythm is fine. Let's syncopate it a little bit. Let's 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 add a little jazz into that. Right. Um, and that starts driving that that play and that variation for it. And the curiosity, because um, I, the boredom factor is something I'm so familiar with. And it's not yeah. the you know and again like it's not a bad thing. It's just okay, I've made this thing. What else can I make? Exactly. You know, and it's like, oh, I learned something cool here. I need to go bigger, better, better kind of situation. And, so, yeah, I totally get the boredom factor. And you live for the day when somebody comes up to you and just says, uh, hey, Mike, how'd you like to start a podcast? And you right. go, I've never done that. I have, As of yesterday, I hadn't thought of that once in my life. Absolutely, I'm in. That sounds exciting. Let's do it. Right. Or yeah. Or it's that somebody says, hey, Mike, I need you to build a puppet for me. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, my God. In the next 15 years of my life. Are... By the way, your puppets for She Killed Monsters. If, if you should put something out for your... Uh, for your you keep telling uh, me this. Uh, at least put out pictures for it because those look staggeringly good. Those were, those were Thank fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So... Uh, you get bored very easy. And one of the other things that is a hallmark of it is that you are inherently collaborative. You are a social animal. You can't be insular. Um, you know, the, the pandemic just happened and a lot of artistic people, pe people that are inherently creative, you you kind of sit around for a, for a day or two and then all of a sudden you start drumming your fingers and you start tapping and you start looking at the walls and you start to get, it's that, it's that, once again, that boredom drives you for, for something, right? I want to do something. I need to do something. Um, you can't be left alone. And you find a lot of people, when you create something, your process can be insular. You can, you can isolate yourself, and, but at the end of it, you want to share. Right. You want to, to give loose. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, this guy comes in, and he's very sort of vain and 
pointing and demanding and everything. And we get into an argument or we get into a discussion, I guess, about what color we're painting the sky in his set. And it's blue. But it's not quite the right shade of blue. And it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just wanted to look at him and say, look, we can spend another hour, and, you know, nothing's open. I, we can stop everything. And then the, the rest of, you know, 99% of your vision won't ever get accomplished because you're so worried about everybody jumping through this hoop. And, and it's not going to matter. Like, it's one shade off, right? It's, it's just a, it's a minor variation. Live with that. Let's move on. And, and he kind of drilled down on that. And it's one of the reasons why I kind of went, I'm not cut out for this particular niche, mm -hmm. but I want to focus a little bit more specific. And, and performer rigging is very cool because some people are very right-brained. Some people are very, I, I forget how it breaks down, but right and left brain, right? Some people are very analytical. They like straight lines. They like right. numbers. Some people are very emotive. They like the story. They like the connection. They like the right. empathy for it. We play fast and loose right down the middle because we're in the science of engineering art. Mm -hmm. And so that's a neat way to look at it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 Because no matter what you do, technically it's all eventually driven by the story. It's right. all driven by the connection. And so let's say you're doing Peter Pan and you want to pick Peter Pan up and you want to move him over here and you want to set him down on this side of the stage. Great. I can bring in an engineer to do that, and they can set up a gantry crane like in some factory, and it'll just winch him straight up in the air, and it'll move him over and set him down. And that will exactly complete the mission brief they were handed, and it will be an absolute failure at the same time. Because it sucks. It's not cool. Right. right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, like, who wants to watch that? Like, that's some sort of weird theater of pain that you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. right. You can also – go ahead. No, no, no. I've got this. You, you, the, I've got this image in my head. I don't know if you've ever seen these charts on social media or something. It's a picture of the brain from the top down, split down the middle. One side is all gray with lots of lines and little notes about being analytical, and the other side, other side, is just color splash, like it's been hit with airbrush and paint splatter, and lots of little handwritten notes about being creative. I think I know exactly which one you're looking, talking yeah. about. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, but suddenly I see this picture in my head with a picture with you added to it with one <laughs> foot on either side. Exactly. So, and, 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 yeah, and so right. people come to you with these challenges. Right. And as, ahead, and, we are so good at talking to each other <laughs> that like, we don't. <laughs> it's almost. We just keep stepping on each other. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'll let you finish for a well, bit. Well, and again, it's the same thing with the puppetry. You know, I need a dragon. I need it to look cool. I need it to move as fluidly as possible. I need somebody to be able. Uh, I need somebody to be able to um, move. You know, lift it effortlessly. Yes. But I still need to build it. And it needs to be robust, and it needs to stand up to the abuse that it's going to get. So it needs to be light and functional and, and just practical from a kinetic standpoint. It needs to be, you know, from a materials strength, from a material right. science standpoint, it needs to be acceptable for those. And then, and if you, if you just fulfill all that, you haven't done anything. Right. Because then it needs to be emotionally engaging by the people that are consuming this. Yeah, and it needs, and to, it, and it it needs to be a story, platform. Right. Exactly. And it needs to be a platform that the person manipulating it can actually interact, it, it, who they can focus their creativity through this output. Mm -hmm. So that so the you know, when you get into rigging. Yeah. Um, that's what kind of drew me to it. And there was one other aspect to it that I really, really like, which is we have to be right 100% of the time or somebody dies. That's it. Ooh. I hate playing for small stakes. I absolutely hate. At 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm losing sleep and I'm arguing over what color paint. Like, to me, if for a nonsense thing, for a one moment, for a minute scene, that, that the audience, if all is going well, it will not. It Nobody's will not. Nobody's going to know what shade of blue that is. Exactly. Right. Um, and he lacked complete faith that everything else would come. Like, 
thank you very much for ignoring the actors and and i and i get you're passionate about this but uh however having that argument when you say if you make the right choice as to the color uh everybody walks home at the end of the night and if you make the wrong choice with what color blue it is uh you're on cnn and not in a good way like <laughs> you know just a new post uh, post office You've just, yeah, my two goals in life, never to be on YouTube and never to be on CNN. Because in my occupation, neither one of those are a good thing. Either it's like, look, wacky thing, somebody fell into a wall, or you've just pulled the roof down of the United Center in Chicago. Um, <laughs> uh, and I like that. I like that stakes. I like having a little bit of stakes for my work. And I like knowing that not only at the end of the day, all that work and all that math and everything that you've really played for uh, – somebody just comes up to you and goes, yeah, that was cool. And you go, that's awesome. That's, that's why we did it. Right. That's why we did it. So, um, I used to jump out of airplanes for a little bit of time. Uh, I used to, be, I used to be in the United States army and airborne corps and everything. And, uh, I have more jumps out of a biplane than I, and Soviet helicopters than I do out of a, a C-17. Like I, I was, I, I have a non-linear life for this. Uh, You're but the there was a collection of skills. I know. It's marvelous. Yeah. Thank Absolutely you. marvelous. Um, th th it's taken from a meme, and I love to say it, but from the outside looking in, my life is unusual, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But from the inside looking out, my life is unusual, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> that's, that's one of the things that I always want people to kind of know today, which is... You know, if, if there's a message to put out, which is, you know, for the for the people that are just getting started, uh, it doesn't have to make sense. Right. It, there's no reason. There, your barriers for entry into just about any occupation are so far removed in the digital world than they were, you know, 20 years ago uh, or, or, or a sure. generation yeah, or two ago. Right. Unfortunately, the system was set up by people about four or five generations ago. This, the system that we're stepping into was largely kind of calcified about the 50s or 60s. And these are the people that, you know, kind of the, the baby boomers greatest generation um, where you, you know, you, you do this, you, you go to college and you get a, you get a right. occupation that's practical and you become, you know, you, you manage a dry cleaner, you become a watchmaker and you do that job for 50 years. And you get your and pension then you, and Yep, you, you bend steel out of Detroit at, at a car manufacturer and, and at the same plant, at the same machine, at the same assembly line, and you make the same widget. And then 40 years later, you get a gold watch and you retire and you go home and then you die, right? right. And that was, and when people come out to that and they go, I'm not wired to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm driven to do something different. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense to the institutions at large. Right. And yeah. from their standpoint, uh, their opinion isn't wrong. It's just outdated. Right. Because nowadays, that does make sense. I, I, there's, there's a great – go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think – I don't think the human animal has ever been hardwired to follow the path, the prescribed path. You know, there's always – there's always the drive. Some people are – more prone to follow the drive or succumb to the drive, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the human animal... I think you're right in the sense that today's uh, existence with the technology and everything else allows us to jump on these impulses and drives to do something that is... You know, we don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> but I think we like to... We're allowed to. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of weird because if you think back, if you, I mean, let's, let's kind of roll it all the way back to, you know, when, when we were living in caves, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we kind of needed two facets to society. We actually needed a lot of people who were just kind of happy doing the thing that we're doing now. If we were all adventurers, if we all just <laughs> tried something new, right? Let's not live in a cave. Let's, let's live underwater. We would all basically, you know, the the the, the win loss percentage for humans trying things is not very good. Let's be honest. Like, 
as an animal, we have horrible risk assessment <laughs> skills. Like we just like, sure. All right, we'll try it. Um, so you need a lot of, <laughs> sure. If, if college taught me anything, let's jump out of it's that the, yeah, all right, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Sure. I can be talked into anything, right? All right. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, <laughs> the trebuchet so story you, comes you, to mind. You kind of, oh my goodness. No, right, we're not going to start that now. We don't have time. All right. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that there there needs to be kind of a a, a a 51% of society is happy with just continuing to do what they do. It's it's a slightly less, and it could be 1%, it could be 49%. There needs to be the artists. There needs mm-hmm. to be the creative types. There needs to be the ones that want to kind of experiment, push the boundaries. Um because they need to come back to something. They they need that support structure if it if if it fails. But if it doesn't, that's what society moves forward, right? That's the that's, that's the free market thought. of ideas. Yeah. And so the the interesting thing is that since at least the majority, the simple majority, are the ones that that aren't really inclined to change, if you are that person, you're the outlier. Mm-hmm. You're the statistical anomaly. You're the one who says, and and you kind of get it, and, you know, and it kind of manifests in all different stripes. You know, I, I didn't feel like I was a part of the group in high school. I didn't, I was the one that was on the outside. And it's like, yeah, you, you hear that in a thousand different stripes. And I'm at work and I have all these great ideas and I'm trying to do this, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't really pan out that way. And so. Right. So yeah. how do you, how do you reconcile the idea that 51% is the comfortable let's do it this way i'm fine with it group and 49 percent is the the creative i'm gonna take a few steps in this direction yeah what uh, happens if we paint the walls blue in this cave yeah uh but how do you reconcile those numbers with the fact that people perceive us weirdo artists as the outliers when you're splitting it almost down the middle um because i don't know the numbers right so you're okay uh, and, and I think the numbers are more than – it's a lot less than 49%. But I don't think it's, it's a such a statistical margin. Exactly. And I think part of, part of it is that you're not hardwired to be one or the other. It's not a toggle. It's a dimmer. It doesn't forth between you're either this or that. You're some degree of this and you're some degree of that. And so inside of all of us, it stands to reason that most of the time you're kind of happy with what you are what you have. There's a few weirdos out there that have a really, that desire to kind of do that more so. And it can kind of tamp down that, that staidness. Right. Uh, and they go, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to do a, I want to build something out of a block of marble, but, uh. The so, problem is this block of marble is only six feet tall, and I need something 18 feet tall. Like, all right, let's go. Let's um, call Bill. Um, exactly. So would you consider yourself – Would the, you're in, in, your own, in your own estimate of yourself, so your percentage of needing that change and that expression and that uh, experimentation, you, would you consider yourself – that percentage of you much larger than the than the comfort readied am i asking Um, that in a way that makes sense yeah no that that makes sense i think it's it's uh, i i i think it's variant on where i am in life i i I think one of the things that we're running into is we're, we're we're getting a little too caught up in pragmatics of it it's not pragmatic it doesn't make sense. Um, so when you talk about creative people and, and art nerdy types, uh, there's not there are overarching rules, but but they're not. Uh, it's very hard to make uh, empiricism to it. You can't just say this six of those. There's you're one of that. You do this. Um, so I think I absolutely am more the, the, the creative type and the, and the boundary pusher if I was back in the caveman days. But, uh, but how does that percolate out of me compared to you? Uh, probably a little bit different. 
Sure. Um, one of the things, so uh, I'll, I'll give you kind of an example of this. So uh, a few years ago, ANSI, the, the National Standards uh, Group in the United States, they're the ones that tell you your bumper has to be this high off the ground. Oh, right. Wiring in your vacuum cleaner has to be this gauge when you run it through. And there are rules for everything, right? The baby crib has to be built this way. They're the ones that set the rules for anything and everything in the United States. Uh, and they're just rules. They're, 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 they're kind of, you know, if you want to do it, this is how you got to do it. And, uh, and they, wanted to make, they, they wanted to set up a set of rules for flying people. And they looked around and they said, oh, well, it's very, we have rules for safety. You know, if you go, if you work a crane or if you go climbing on a very high building construction, we have rules for safety. Uh, so if we fly somebody, it needs to be this safe. And everybody, you know, there were sort of two camps in this room. And those were the ones that wanted to impart this kind of empiricism. And then there were the practical types that have been in this engineering the art for a while and we raised our hand and we said okay what about uh, the flying trapeze what happens if the whole goal of this act is that i'm going to get somebody over here and i'm going to launch them 52 feet in the air and they're going to happen to catch a little thing that they're swinging on and then they go back and forth what happens if you go to the circus and you see the guy on the tightrope or you see the guy who's uh, doing on a silk or a lira or what happens if you go to peter pan and, and you go see Mary Poppins or if you go see Wizard of Oz, one of those stock shows where people fly. Uh, we want the cables as thin as possible or not at all. I can't put a cable on these people, on some of these acrobats. It's, it's unsafe, right? We, we, we can't do that. And so then everybody sort of looks at you and goes, why do you got to be such a dick about it? Um, and they say, well, then obviously put them on a machine. And we go, but what if we can't? What if that's not the act? Um, it became so hard to write these rules. Now, eventually they did. And what they had to do was instead of saying, this is how you do it, they have to basically say, if you're going to do it, at least put it into this world, right? Here are some guidelines. It needs to be, you know, the design factor needs to be this. The empiricism needs to be this, unless it's not, right? That's kind of, that's kind of what they had to say. And the rules, uh, uh, ANSI 1.43-216, performer rigging. Um, uh, it's 78 pages if you print the whole thing out. Wow. And, it's, oh, and the very first one is just like, here are the rules, and if you are competent to change them, go with the grace of God, we got nothing for you after this. So that's kind of the rules it comes for. And when you look at creative people getting back to our argument, um, <laughs> that's the way I would approach it, right? One of the things that creative people also have is that they have a tolerance for risk. You have an optimism. You, you have to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic that it's all going to work out, right? That's why you buy your lottery ticket. Or in this case, that's why you spend <laughs> years of your life, you know, down in the basement, knuckling around with whatever project right. you're working on. I'm alone with a box of paper writing a script. I'm optimistic that A, it's actually going to happen and not just fall apart catastrophically, even though you might have done this a thousand times. I've just never finished one, but I'm, I've got a new idea. I'm going to start in on this today. You're optimistic on it. And then you have a tolerance for risk that is inconceivable by most of the people. Not That's a that fascinating they, observation. Yeah. It's not that they don't understand it. They can't conceive they of it. can't risk it. Because you look at it, I, I know, how many people do we know in the arts who said, you know, I'm gonna, I got a buddy of mine who's, you know, he, he's down in Charleston, I'm up in Chicago, he offered me a job, I'm gonna get on my motorcycle, fit all my worldly possessions, uh, you know, drive down there. And you go, oh, how, uh, great, you got a job? And he's like, oh yeah, it's gonna be all weekend. <laughs> and, I'm moving to, and I'm moving to a different city for that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that I've met is, those guys. I know these people. Yes, I know. I, 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 yes, I've had that discussion with people. I, mm -hmm. I was traveling across the country and I caught up with an old high school friend of mine and I said, oh, we'll get dinner and we'll hang out. And I said, I got a job. I'm, I'm up on the East Coast. I'm driving across in my car. I loaded everything up and I'm heading out there. And, and he said, oh, great. And we're, we had a lovely dinner and we're talking and finally we're out on this back deck afterwards. And, and you, you got to realize this guy was also, a, he was in engineering and, and he could tell you he had a job and he, sat behind us and he flew it all day and he could tell you 
how much money he was going to make from this day to the day he retired. Like he he didn't have job security. He he had sort of a, a, a he had made a vault out of it. Like he had he had he had in, he had job incrustation. Um, <laughs> And he said, so tell me about this new job that you have. And I said, oh, it's awesome. I'm going to go out there. It's all summer long. I've got, I've got about three months lined up. And then I got something right after that that I'm going to go to that's somewhere else. And that's fantastic. Basically, I'm, this is spring, and I'm employed until November. This is like a new level for me. I've never had this much just freedom of, of knowing where my next paycheck comes from. Uh, we were also well into our 30s when this conversation was going on. And... Uh, <laughs> And all of a sudden, he just stared at me blankly, and he said, you're not talking about a job. You're talking about a gig. Like, you're not talking, like, you're not talking about a career. I thought you were going somewhere for, like a, like, a salaried position at some, you know, firm somewhere. And I said, why in God's name would I want to do that? Like, <laughs> and we just stared, stared at each other for a moment, like – he couldn't conceive of my life and I couldn't conceive of his question. Like, what, what are you, why would I ever do that? Um, so yeah, we, uh, uh, yeah. So people who are in the arts have, have a tolerance for risk, not like gambling and not like driving fast in cars. It manifests in a slightly different way. Right. It's, 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 it's a lot more, <laughs> it's a lot more kind of, uh, pervasive and, and, uh, just, you know, infiltrates into your life in that way where you go, I'm, I'm bored and I'm also willing to risk everything and I'm going to drop everything. I'm going to go out to California and, uh, you know, the, the great line in the Muppet show where they run into Big Bird and he says, I'm going to Bombay, India to be a television star. Right. And they say, you don't go to Bombay, India to be a television star. And he says, sure, if you want to do it the easy way. Um, <laughs> and, and he keeps right on walking and yep. he just, like, all right. And then he got everybody else just can't conceive of it. And he is off because that is a perfect plan for him. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do we want to tell the people the trebuchet story? No. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll do another episode on the trebuchet story. I promise we will come Excellent. back to it. All right. Um, well, well, then we'll cut, cut that little bit out so that, so that we oh, don't no, no, tease no. it. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to tease the world with it because I think the world needs oh, okay. to know it. <laughs> it's not that exciting. Because I think uh, it perfectly encompasses the idea of you have a much higher tolerance for risk <laughs> than others because that is a, a balls to the wall story so, as far as I'm concerned. So Chicago Bulls are in the playoffs and they're on like game five. You know, they're they're they have it, it has been a white knuckle. And this was a couple years ago. And this is the the biggest th this was the moment that more people have seen my work, this particular bit of work than anything. If you have to ask, you know, what's your most famous beat? Nobody knew it was me, but uh the gentleman is known as uh, the gentleman. The, the character is Benny the Bull. The gentleman that, that plays this character uh, got in touch with the company that I work for. And I was managing and me and my mentor were there. And he said, I want to fly in at tip off. I want to, uh, you know, as the as they're, you know, the, the drums are brrr, and the crowd's getting all psyched up. And just about the time they're going to he's going to descend in from the ceiling. The Chicago Bulls mascot in the United Center is going to descend in. It's going to go live over television it'll be fantastic and we said sure we can Absolutely. do that easy enough to do um and then you realize that it is an 11 story building that's hollow <laughs> and it ends in a basketball court so if you fall you're not gonna bounce like <laughs> there's it's gonna be a it's going to be a horrific and celebrated death on national television, and you are responsible for it. And so uh, we put this together, and, and you're going to belay them in. And right before it, like, the, they're counting down. Five, four, three. And as they're counting down, somebody, as is our traditional good luck greeting or, or well-wishing, I guess, uh, over the radio, says, all right, everybody stand by and don't screw up. Go! And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the last thing you hear is makes your spine tighten. <laughs> so, for for anybody who's seen that, you rigged you rigged Benny the Bull. Yeah, I I was one of the people who did. Yes. Okay, there, and there 11, were a few of us that day. I have so many questions. Um, in an eleven-story building, 
basically mm-hmm. an upside down bowl. Mm-hmm. Was there any place to start up high, or did you just rig him, costume him, and then hang him there till it was time? What happened? So the thing you got to realize is we had about twenty four hour notice because um, we ran out that day, oh, checked it, man. checked it, and then came back, ran back, grabbed everything, came back the next day and did it. So we had about twenty four hour notice because they don't know game to game. The other thing you got to realize is that to, for a for a basketball game, um, if you want the first, if you want your five starting players to take the court, you're going to write a check for about. I don't know, $25, $30 million just in their salaries alone. The entertainment budget per game is dozens of dollars. Like they, (laughs) you know, we're talking about, and we're like, oh, it's the Bulls. How how great is that? Oh, no, 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 no. They are, to say they're on a shoestring is not even a good representation. It's just the way the money's allocated. Um, But it's this giant arena, and there are massive catwalks, and this giant unsupported roof you have to realize this is a massive unsupported roof and it has to anticipate Chicago snow. It's robust. It's so it's so some of those mechanics weren't a problem. Oh, exactly. So to find something to rig him from and the guy who happened to play him at the, the, the gentleman who was playing the mascot or is the mascot. And he'd, he'd been there for years was the most, fearless gentleman that I've ever met. And I, once again, I don't know whether he has no concept of risk or whether he didn't appreciate it or whether he's just wired to go. And I think it was more the latter than the former. We go out there. And so you get there that day and they say, okay, you can have some rehearsal time. We're doing some film and, and the players are going to arrive at this time. So you have between, you know, your window is between 247 and 308 today to do all your rehearsing whatever you want and then you've got to clear the building and then you got to leave and so you know it's very precise safety is not uh is not an argument you can make because you know you say well we need a little bit longer it's it's costing millions of dollars a minute to to wow. delay some of the things <laughs> kick this down the line you're not you know you're having a hard time writing those checks uh and so we, we get there that afternoon, we set everything up, and, and we're fine, we're working up, and, and he comes out, and he's got one chance to sort of take this ride, it's a one-way ride all the way down, and, uh, and he's got one chance, so we, we put him in the harness, and we kind of fit it underneath his costume, and then he's, and, and what his, what, what it is, is that picture a uh, string that's in the middle of your back, uh, a, a cable that attaches right between your shoulder blades. It goes up and it splits into a letter Y. It splits in two directions. One goes up to one catwalk and one goes up to the other catwalk. And so we have the ability to kind of not only move him back and forth, but we have a redundancy. And, right. And I'm, I'm one of the sides and there's a, a gentleman who's on the other side. Uh, so we, we clip him on or we, we, he basically has to climb over the railing above and he's if you're scared of heights you're you're sort of panicky just to be there and he goes skipping down the catwalk and he's got to get clipped in and climb over the railing and then basically let go and and take that moment of weightlessness where he is now suspended by a a little piece of cable that's (laughs) about the size of your pinky maybe um uh staggeringly high in the air and uh and then we let him go so we get him in for rehearsal, and he shows up and goes, hey, so we're doing this now? And he starts climbing over, and we're going, no, 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 you're not clipped up yet. Like, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> like, no, 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 stop. Uh, he's, he's just go. He's willing to do it. He's game for anything. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, we did that. And uh, there is massive catwalks, and there is a linear run in the ceiling of the United Center which is exactly as long as you need to get somebody out all the way from floor to ceiling to the lowest point. So if you grab one and you just start running from one end of the building to the other end of the building, across the catwalks in that little sort of curved space. And I know this for a reason, because that worked very well. And they said, oh, come back. And so we, we managed to come back a few more times. And one of the times he wanted to, to uh, go up now, and so oh, there is a fly out. Exactly. Yeah. It's it, it was not the time nor the budget to to bring in a winch, which is what we would normally do. 
and and you have to figure out a way to cart this thing across a catwalk all the way up to the ceiling and they they hadn't allowed for that and so we it's it's human powered and there ain't no way you're just going to go hand over hand and pull this up so we take a little page from history um you know, if, if you want to be good in the arts, one of the things that you should do is take a look at, like, what the ancient Greeks did. And go back to the Romans, go back to the Persians, go back to the Chinese, go back to the ancients. Because they had to figure a lot of this out, and they did. And so there's a lot of theatrical gags and a lot of stuff that work fantastically today. Um, and even, like, a lot of the cosplay and a lot of the Ren Faire stuff, like, a lot of the stuff that works fantastically today is not new. It's right. It's fantastic. So there's a method for flying people, which you just, you know, it's, it's a tug of war. It's called the Hong Kong method. You just grab, put more people on the line and we all pull together. Eventually, I'm going to get enough people that we can lift whatever you want off the ground, right? I can lift a 4,000-pound video wall. I just need to find enough people to help me out with it. 8,000 people to do it. Exactly. So if you clip a couple of people together and you make a human dog sled team, and you just kind of yell, mush, and they start running down a catwalk, you can shoot a guy the entire height of that <laughs> arena. <laughs> what a marvelous picture in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can launch Benny the Bull all the way to the top Loving of the United stories. <laughs> exactly. Okay. There's a... If, you, if you're a big fan of, like, uh, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and you can find the deep DVD and can play the DVD because let's be honest that that technology that's is fading. One, yeah, that's that's the that's the tough nut to crack. And the DVD extras. There's a scene in the show where they're in the movie where they're bouncing through the bamboo forest and they're 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 doing these huge bounds over an actual mountainous bamboo forest. How you do that is you hook up a couple of 250 foot cranes and they're way out of shot and they're just. And they're literally bounding the actor hundreds of feet in the air. And they're just swinging through space. And they're kind of bounding him lightly across the top of these trees. Well, over there, labor is a lot cheaper than it is over here. And so there's one scene on how they did it. And there's a rope that's going up the hill. And there's probably 200 people holding onto this rope. Oh, no and there's way. a guy with a bullhorn who's just standing there yelling like, all right, everybody. And you can tell they've thrown everybody. The caterer, the, the, the stand-in guy, you know, you, who, why are you here? I don't care. Grab the rope. Get on. <laughs> we're all going to pull at the same time. And we're going to run as far as we can. And then we're going to run back as far as we're going to lift them up and let them back in again. Uh find a friend it's it works fantastically uh it's the same way they did it there is a uh there's a recorded uh the cathedral in reims france back in the middle ages uh, flying became in vogue for a little bit and they wanted to fly the entire chorus up into the heavens at the end of some christmas you know spectacular Dang. yeah so some mass or celebration of such and there's a recorded instance somebody wrote this down and the ending of the, 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 the chorus, the ending of this big number, they fly all 200 members of the chorus up into the ceiling of this church on wooden boards and hemp rope going over wooden shivs. Like, all that tells me. Uh, I'm not impressed by the engineering of it. And, and let's be honest, that had to have been pretty impressive because that was some... What it tells me is that there's always a low man on the totem pole because there was some <laughs> poor slob with like a with like a handsaw, like crap, and then like all right, all right, Steve, when I say go, pull this rope, like Bill's ancestors, oh. Middle Ages. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so lest you ever get enamored by the glamour of my occupation, I always put that into reference for you. Uh, the 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 that. The, the, automatically brings to mind my favorite quote that you've ever told me uh and that is you don't you don't need to find the way you just need to find a way exactly yeah okay we are approaching time here i want to ask you a, a couple more questions before uh, i've only asked you one i'll be very honest with you um <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> um is there any other art that you have not dabbled in that you think you might want to try someday? Um, sure, make me an offer. Uh, it's it's kind of great. One of the things that successful artists have is 
once again, humans aren't wired and you're kind of counter wired and, and your counter wiring makes you say yes instead of no. The, the Darwinian instinct is to say, of self-preservation, is to say, no, I don't want to do that. Hey, you want to help me write a book? Sure. Okay. You want to, you want to do a podcast? Sure. You want to do a product? Sure. You want to do this? Absolutely. Let's travel. So great. Um, and how it kind of creeps out, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would love to. One of the things that I'm missing, I did a lot of... Uh, decade or so ago is kind of what it finally went was uh was tabletop gaming and dungeons and dragons really oh yeah i was a big D D geek in in high school and uh and now i have a little one and she my daughter is nine and uh and it's fantastic because she has always given me a reason to just do what i want to do anyway but now when i do it you know like let's dress up and 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 go play go play make believe. But now when I do it with her, I'm a good father instead of a lunatic. Uh, <laughs> finally, <laughs> exactly. Finally, I have validation, uh, and she is very much so. So she has kind of gotten into that. Uh, she's kind of more into LARPing. She doesn't want to sit. She wants to do. She wants to uh, prance and about. So yeah, costume that 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 child will change costumes. You know, four or five times a day, or change clothing, change outfits four or five times a day. Because it's like, hey, I'm going to go play mermaid. I'll be right back. I've got to put a mermaid costume on. And then she's off. Uh, so uh, oh, she's that's beautiful. kind of. That's great. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And so that's kind of one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm I can't wait to get back into because I miss, I miss the social aspect of it. Right. I miss the, the creative outlet and the, and the, the dynamics. But, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any art form that you would never want to try. I don't know. It sounds kind of see. see once I again, these question. are absolutes. These are absolutes, and 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 if you can't tell, I'm not really an absolutes kind of yeah, guy. Yeah, I've noticed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, fine. <laughs> um, the the and I'm gonna give some lame stock answer like ah, the boring. You know, something that's boring, something that's lackluster. So that's kind of what it is. Um. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have one. Yeah, I love this question because I get the same answer from everybody. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, sure, I'll think of one someday, but probably not. Yeah, and it's, and that's it's, it's a no matter it's how kind of an eye opener. It's interesting. Yeah, no matter how stupid it sounds, if it's a good pitch or it looks like it's an entertaining time, I'm still in. Trebuchet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we will get together and do this one for the podcast too. Um. Anyway, last question. Where can we see some of your art? So right now I am one of the owners of a flying effects company that's based out of Southern Indiana. Um, during the pandemic, I had, I stepped down from, uh, I stepped down from education. I have always had one foot in education. I've always had one foot in production and, and it kind of varies. And I, in about 2019, as I say, I switched feet, um, I stepped a little bit more out of education full time and doing production work on the side, and I went into production work. I had a, a very good friend who has been talking to me for years, saying, "Come on in, come on in. The company needs you. Come on." We, and I kept saying, "No, no, no." And uh, and at one point, it just seemed like a good time, and uh, I wasn't having a good time at my job, and I just decided, you know what, it is time for a change. And so, <laughs> much to everyone's surprise, you know that tolerance for risk. It, Chucked everything and the boredom factor and, uh, hit. Time yeah, and as I say, right before the pandemic hit, I stepped out of education and into production, which is sort of like dodging a bullet by jumping in front of a bus. Uh, <laughs> nice timing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in in March of 2020, we were on the island of Guam. Uh, I was working for a resort. They were doing a magic show, and we we're reconfiguring the little magic show, and. Uh, it was, it was not a little magic show. It was a giant Vegas style. You know, they, ha they actually have white tigers at this facility. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, I have the opportunity to have been mauled by a white tiger. I didn't take it, but it still was there should I have been so inclined. Um, <laughs> it's, it's nice to have. So your risk, you know. there is a threshold for your risk taking. Exactly. Well, that's what I say. It, it's not a logical risk taking. You know, I don't drive my car fast, but uh, but at the same time, I'm more than happy to chuck a salaried position with benefits to go into the arts. Um, 
<laughs> so that you know that's that's that does your career counselor good. <laughs> He's uh when when you just see your therapist start scribbling stuff out on the notepad, it's never a good sign. <laughs> and they like, can't ah, keep up. Like, oh, <laughs> never mind. Um, okay, I need you to be practical for like one <laughs> half a minute. All right. Give me some uh, like websites or places to see your artwork. Flying by Troy. If you want, we do uh, we do flying effects. Yeah, you can uh, you can catch me on YouTube if you if you just search my name, William Ian Ald. I did a TED talk that kind of can uh, encapsulate some of these thoughts as well. Um, and uh, and uh, look around. I guess I'm on I'm on social media and such. But uh, but yeah, that's that's the place to find my stuff. Flying by Troy. Flying by Troy. Okay, and the TED talk. Yeah, I'll dig those. Um... Dig those uh, links out, put them in the description here, and uh, maybe get you some more business. You know what? As, as just make people happy. Okay. Then, uh, yeah, I'll just let people be impressed with your work then. Bill Ald, I can't thank you enough. You were one of the great philosophers of our time. Oh. Whether you know sure. it or not. And yeah, I, really... I hope people, I hope people who listen to this appreciate what a good guy you are. See, I've we've happened to know each other for for a very long time. We met a very long time ago, and have managed to stay friends and and professional friends as well. So and in touch, to, you know, we... and, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. But but I hope people appreciate that that, and I can say this without without any sort of <laughs> without any sort of payment for it coming. Uh, <laughs> You're you're genuinely a nice guy, and and Aww. if this podcast goes far and it goes well, or it just connects with somebody, good, because you're people in this world, and we need more good people. We need the good guys to win on occasion, and I'm glad to see that you're doing something that that can happen. On. So, well, thank you very much. Absolutely, like I said, people need to check out your stuff too. Yes, I will. Uh, yeah, we Bill and I tend to gush over each other. It gets kind of gross at times, but it happens. Yep. Anyway, but I thank you so, so much uh, <clears throat> for spending the morning with me and spouting your wisdom. Um, yeah, it's always thank fun. Thank you so to much you. for giving me a format. This was one time. Yeah, and we will come back with the trebuchet story, I promise. I'll leave it up to you. Okay. I'll talk to you then. Take care. <laughs>